Welcome to this tutorial on the use of the Bridge Designer 2016 software. The purpose of the Bridge Designer is to introduce you to engineering through the design of a steel truss highway bridge. The purpose of this tutorial is to guide you through the process of creating and optimizing a bridge design. So let's get started. When you start up the Bridge Designer, this is the screen you'll see initially. Now we're going to create a new bridge design. And this option is already selected, so we'll just click the OK button, which will bring up the Design Project Setup Wizard. Step 1 of the wizard is just to familiarize with our design requirement, which is to design a four-lane highway bridge to span this steep river valley, ensuring that the bridge is strong enough to carry a standard truck loading while also costing as little as possible. Now click Next. And at step 2, if you're participating in a local bridge design contest, this is the place to enter your local contest code. We're not participating in a local contest here, so just click Next again, and we arrive at step 3, where we'll set the deck elevation and support configuration for our bridge. Now note that initially the bridge is positioned at the very top of the river valley, resulting in the maximum possible span length of 44 meters but we can change this deck elevation by clicking this down arrow, like this, and you'll note that as the bridge gets lower in the valley, it also gets shorter. Now recall that our requirement is to design a bridge with the lowest possible cost, so you might be tempted to choose this lowest possible deck elevation, and therefore the shortest span, on the assumption that a shorter span will also be less expensive. <laughs> but not so fast. As you can see, when we bring the bridge from the top of the valley down to the bottom, we also need to bring the roadway along with it. This will require a lot of excavation, which will add to the overall cost of the bridge. The cost of excavation is a major contributor to the site cost, which is calculated automatically by the bridge designer and is shown right here. For this particular support configuration and deck elevation, the site cost is $138,500, which includes the excavation and the cost of these concrete supports, which are called abutments. Now, note that if I increase the deck elevation, the site cost gets progressively lower because of the reduced amount of excavation. And with the bridge at the top of the valley, the site cost is much reduced at $63,200. This is one example of a phenomenon we'll see often in using the bridge designer, that engineering design always involves trade-offs. If we try to optimize a design based on one criterion, the result will almost always be less than optimal with respect to at least one other criteria. In this specific case, minimizing the bridge cost by setting the lowest possible deck elevation will also maximize the site cost, and vice versa. Minimizing the site cost by using the highest possible deck elevation will also maximize the bridge cost. Now, in these situations, the engineer's job is to find the best compromise between these two competing design criteria, typically by trying many different alternatives and then selecting the best one. For our purpose in this tutorial, we'll just choose the deck elevation of 12 meters, which is right here in the middle of our possible range. And the result is a span length of 32 meters. Now before we move on, note that here at step 3, it's also possible to change the types of supports our bridge will use. For example, instead of standard abutments, we might choose to use arch supports. And we can vary the height of the arch as well, like this. We might also add a pier in the middle of the river valley, to provide additional support, and we can change the height of the pier as well, like that. Each of these support configurations has its own advantages and disadvantages, as well as its own unique cost. But to keep it simple, we're just going to stick with standard abutments and no pier for this tutorial. And so we'll click the Next button to move on to Step 4, where we can choose between two different deck materials and two different truck loading configurations. But again, for this tutorial, let's just keep it simple and stick with the default choices, and move on to Step 5. 
Here we have an opportunity to select something called a template, which is really just a guide that will allow us to use a standard truss configuration as the basis for our design. Now we aren't required to use a template, but it's a good tool for beginners because it will ensure that we start our design with a stable structural configuration that will be able to carry load successfully. I'm going to choose this Warren through truss configuration and then we'll click next. Here at step six, I'm going to add my own name to the design. So it will appear on the drawing board and on any printouts of my completed design. And finally, we'll click the finish button and the bridge designers drawing board is now set up and ready for us to go to work. Now notice that our 32 meter span is correctly positioned at an elevation of 12 meters above the river and that the template for our Warren truss is displayed in light gray dotted lines on the screen. At this point we're going to create a structural model for our truss in two steps first drawing joints and then drawing members. The joints are points at which the steel bars that constitute the truss are connected together and we cr can create these joints just by clicking at the appropriate points with the mouse like this. The joints are located at the light gray circles indicated on our template. And note, by the way, that the lower nine joints, the ones on the level of the deck, have already been drawn for us by the bridge designer software automatically. Also note that if we make a mistake, for example, by drawing a joint out here in the wrong location, we can just undo our mistake by clicking the undo button up on the toolbar. Now, having drawn the eight joints across the top of our truss bridge, we're ready to switch to the member tool here and then draw the members by first placing the mouse over a joint, then depressing and holding the left mouse button and dragging the mouse to the next joint and finally releasing the button to complete the member. Following the same procedure, click, drag and release, click, drag and release, click, drag and release, we can draw all of the remaining members of our structural model by simply going from joint to joint like this. Now across the bottom of the truss and the top of the truss, we can actually just draw one single long member and the software will automatically break it up into a series of shorter members of uh, approximately four meter length. Now we've completed our structural model, but before we test it, you must certainly have noticed that as we were adding members, this member list on the side of the screen was also being created. Now, each line in this list corresponds to one member in our structure. For example, if we click member number one here, we can see that it corresponds to this diagonal member in the actual structural model. Note that all of the members in our truss are composed of a material called carbon steel, abbreviated CS. And this is the case because carbon steel was selected by default up here on this drop down list on the toolbar while we were creating our structural model. We could also have chosen from two other types of steel as you see here, high strength low alloy steel and quenched and tempered steel. Similarly, each member of our structural model is a solid bar with a size of 140 millimeters. Though we could also have chosen hollow tubes as you see here, or we could have chosen from a wide range of different sizes from the member size drop down. Now at this point we really have no idea if these are good choices. We just accepted them as the defaults offered by the software, recognizing that we can change all of these properties for each individual member later in the design process if we need to. Now how do we know if these member properties are appropriate? Well we need to test our design by clicking the load test button on the toolbar located right here. And after clicking this button, we see an animation of our bridge, the one we just designed, first subjected to its own weight and then to the specified truck loading. And as you can see here, our design fails. The bridge collapses down into the river. But don't worry, engineering design is an inherently iterative process. And so all we need to do now is to go back to the drawing board 
by clicking the drawing board button immediately adjacent to the load test button. And now back at the drawing board, we can see that the software is telling us which specific members failed during the most recent load test. These three here on the top cord of the truss. Thus, our next design task is to strengthen these three specific members so the structure will be strong enough to carry the truck successfully. To accomplish this goal, the easiest strategy is simply to increase the size of these three members. To do that, I'll first use the selection tool here and then select one of the failed members by clicking on it. And then I'll change the member size from 140 up to 150. Once again, we'll do that with the second of our three field failed members, changing from 140 to 150. And then finally for the third. And notice that I can also change the member size by clicking this button here, which will increase it by one size to 150. Now when we click the load test button again, we see that our efforts to strengthen the structure have indeed been successful, as the truck crosses the bridge successfully with no problems. We now have a successful design. Now, it's not necessarily an optimal one. It's actually much more expensive than it really needs to be. But before we can go back to the drawing board to start working on optimization, let's pause to look at the colors of the bridge members displayed during this load test animation. This is a very very important feature of the Bridge Designer software. Notice that the members up on top of the bridge, the element that we call the top cord, are turning red. And the ones on the bottom, that's the bottom cord, are turning blue. Now red means compression, the type of loading that causes a structural member to squash or shorten. Blue means tension, the type of loading that causes a member to stretch or lengthen. And notice that the intensity of these colors varies significantly across the bridge. The more intense the color, the more heavily loaded a member is. A bright red member, then, is loaded almost to its maximum capacity in compression. A bright blue member is loaded almost to its maximum capacity in tension. A white, or very lightly colored member, is experiencing very light loading, much less than its capacity in either tension or compression, which means that this member is actually a lot stronger than it really needs to be. Now, this is important because our next task is to optimize our design. And the easiest way to optimize the structure is to reduce the size of members that are significantly stronger than they need to be. For example, note that the six diagonal members here in the center of the bridge seem to be quite light. So we can probably make them a lot smaller to reduce the cost of our design. Let's go back to the drawing board and give it a try. Now here on the drawing board, note that the bridge designer has automatically calculated the total cost of our bridge, $293,721. And by the way, if you'd like to know exactly how this cost is calculated, just click this calculator button adjacent to the cost, and all the numbers are shown in this cost calculation report. Now let's try reducing the size of those six center diagonals to reduce the cost of our design. I'm first going to select all six members by holding down the control key while I click each of those six members. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now I'll change their size from 140 millimeters down to 90 millimeters. Note that the cost drops quite substantially, from $296,000 down to about $274,000. But of course, we can't celebrate until we've run the load test to ensure that the revised design can still carry the truckload successfully. And indeed it can. Now let's try another optimization. Notice that all of the members along the bottom cord of the truss are relatively light blue. So we can probably make them somewhat smaller as well. Back to the drawing board, and we can now select all of the bottom cord members at once by simply dragging a box around them with the mouse. And now, I'll change all of those member sizes to, let's say, 100 millimeters. Once again, we get a good cost reduction, but I can't be sure that it's adequate until we run the load test. Ah, but this design fails the load test. Note, however, that when we return to the drawing board, we see that only the two center members on the bottom cord actually failed. 
So we only need to make those two members one size larger, like this, and then test again. And we see that at this point, the design is successful. So we have, in fact, successfully reduced the total cost of our design down to $256,000. Quite an improvement. And we can still do a lot better. First, by continuing this process of reducing the size of members that are stronger than they need to be, and then by experimenting with different materials and with different cross-section shapes. Now, recall that our design used carbon steel for all the members in the structure but that we could also use either of these two stronger types of steel available on the drop-down box. Stronger steels are more expensive, but because they're stronger, members made of these materials can use smaller sizes. So, is it better to use a smaller, stronger member or a larger, weaker one? Well, that's for you to determine by exploring these different options and seeing which one results in the lower cost. And what about cross-section shape? Well, recall that our current design uses all solid bars. However, any given member could also be changed to a hollow tube. And here I'll give you an important hint. Solid bars tend to be more economical for tension, while hollow tubes are usually more economical for compression. This is because members in compression usually fail due to a unique failure mode called buckling. And hollow tubes are much more effective in resisting buckling than are solid bars. Now, using these techniques, that is, selecting the optimum material, cross-section, and size for every member in our truss, you should be able to get the cost of this particular bridge down below $205,000 without too much difficulty. I'll leave that process up to you. But you can actually do better by also experimenting with the geometric configuration of the truss itself. For example, you might have noticed that many real-world bridges have an arch shape. We can actually achieve this sort of shape with our structural model simply by dragging the joints with the mouse, like this. Of course, once we've changed the shape of the bridge, it will carry load fundamentally differently, so we'll need to go back and optimize the member sizes and cross-sections all over again to determine the minimum possible cost for this new geometric configuration. And finally, remember that we started this design by selecting one particular deck elevation and one particular support configuration in the design project setup wizard. We really want to find the overall lowest possible cost, well, We'll need to start all over again by clicking the New Design button here, and then saving our existing design. Then going back to Step 3 in the Design Project Setup Wizard, and trying different elevations and different support configurations until we find the one that results in the absolute minimum total cost. And by the time you've worked through this process a few times, I guarantee that you'll have learned a lot about bridges and especially about the process that practicing engineers use to design real-world structures. Thanks for watching this tutorial and happy designing!